so glad that you are all here today to chat about six ways to boost your child's self-esteem and build self-confidence, because this is such an important issue. And I know it's one that many of you are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we make certain that our children have strong self-esteem and a good self-image? You know, we know that all children have talents and are amazing in their own ways, but it seems that especially children with ADHD, they're incredibly smart very creative. They think outside the box. They can be incredibly caring and energetic and funny. I talk to parents all day long and usually I'll start with, tell me what's great about your child. And the conversation will go on for quite some time where they explain how amazing their child is. And that is so important to keep in mind that they have so many valuable characteristics, amazing traits. And if they learn how to manage those traits, then they can always be positive characteristics in their lives. However, even though we know they're smart and creative and caring, all of these wonderful things, we still find that many children with ADHD have low self-esteem. ADHD can actually negatively affect self-esteem. And you can imagine why, due to their inability to follow through with multiple step instructions, to control their emotions, to plan and prioritize and organize, to get their homework in turned in when they finish it. You know, these are all areas that are definitely weak for them. They have weak executive function. And due to their weak executive function, the day-to-day, -day, even though they can be incredibly intelligent, the day-to-day -day can be very difficult. And many of you here today are on the receiving end of that, right? Because you're the one getting the call from the teacher. And one call can go into all of the things that went wrong that day, right? Your child forgot to turn in their homework or got into an argument with their classmates was unable to finish the assignments during class. So now they have to bring those assignments home in addition to the homework, or maybe they performed poorly on a test that you knew they were prepared for. So this can be a call that you get quite often sometimes. And not only can it be frustrating to you, but of course it's frustrating to your child because your child knows that they are smart. They're smart or smarter than their peers. So they wonder why does it seem that I have to work so hard? Why does it seem that I'm always getting in trouble even though I'm really trying, right? No one wants to fail. Everyone wants to do well. So sometimes it may really become a negative thing to get up in the morning and go to school. And uh, that can be difficult, even though we know we have so many wonderful teachers who are great at really assisting our children and helping them develop that positive self-image, it can still be very difficult. Because you can imagine if you were going to your job every day and these were the types of reports that you were getting, you wouldn't wanna go to your job either. So ADHD and weak executive function can often lead to lower self-esteem. Once they have low self-esteem, you may start seeing, especially around the preteen years or teen years, that your child seems to be avoiding things. So they may avoid the assignments that have been given to them. So even though you know they know how to do the assignment, they may be procrastinating and avoiding those assignments, or they may be avoiding trying new things or interacting with their peers. And uh, oftentimes that avoidance can be misinterpreted as lack of motivation or possibly, um, uh, you know, just being difficult, a difficult child who doesn't want to do anything. Um, and so that could be a misinterpretation. It's usually not that they have a lack of motivation. It's more of a feel of failure. 
a fear of failure, I should say, so that they are avoiding certain situations that in the past have been difficult for them or in the past they've experienced that failure. So it's easier just to avoid it rather than engage and fail. And self-esteem is so important. And you all know this, right? Self-esteem impacts your decision-making process, your relationships, your emotional health, and your overall well-being. So what can we do? What can we do as parents? What can we do as educators, as counselors to help our children develop that positive self-esteem? We're gonna talk about six different strategies that I'm hoping you can start incorporating today. Uh, and some of them you have certainly heard of in the past, but perhaps I'll state it in a different way or have you think of it in a new light. Maybe I'll connect it to executive function so it makes a little bit more sense to you. And hopefully these strategies will help. But as I said, if you have some strategies you want to share that have worked for you, certainly do type them in the chat box because that will really help the rest of the attendees today to learn different strategies that you have used. First, I encourage you to talk to your child about ADHD because if your child has been diagnosed ADHD and your child is aware of that, you may have an idea of what ADHD is and you assume that your child has the same understanding, but your child's understanding may be very different than the one that you want them to know. You want them to have a very specific understanding of ADHD. So here are some key talking points that perhaps you can incorporate into your conversation. First of all, no one knows what causes an attention difficulty. However, ADHD does seem to run in many families. So oftentimes here at Play Attention, when we design a program for the family, we're often uh, setting up a customized plan for the parent or parents. And then we're also customizing a plan for the child. We've even had situations where we're customizing a plan for the grandparents the parents and the children. So it is very common for ADHD to run in families. So that if that is true in your case, then you have a wonderful opportunity to relate to your child. Explain to your child that you also have ADHD and you can talk about some of the difficulties that you've experienced and how you overcame them. So make certain that you are very honest and open with your child so that they understand that this is something you deal with as well and that you have to try certain strategies in order to you know, turn your work assignments in on time, to get along with your colleagues, to control your emotions. When they know that you can relate to them and they understand, that can really help them open up and discuss with you more and more some of the areas that they may need some, some assistance with. Also, you want to explain that there's nothing wrong with them, right? Oftentimes I'll hear parents say, you know, my child keeps asking me if since I have to um, give them their medication in the morning, they ask if there's something wrong with them. And so we want to really steer away from this negative connotation that there's nothing wrong with them, that it's simply a learning difference. And if we can accommodate their needs and understand how they learn, then they can truly reach their full potential and highlight the positives of ADHD, right? All those things we talked about earlier, usually people with ADHD are incredibly uh, creative and smart and think outside the box. You have the ability to hyper-focus. However, even though we have all of these positive characteristics, we simply need to learn how to manage those characteristics and the underlying cognitive skills so that we can be successful. You also want to emphasize the fact that ADHD does not define them. And you know, this webinar, this entire presentation really stemmed 
from my conversation I had with a parent not too long ago where she said, you know, my daughter who was, I think 15, 15 or 16, my daughter has truly embraced her ADHD. And she didn't mean that in a positive way. She meant that in a negative way in that she allowed her ADHD to define who she was, what she could do, what she couldn't do. So whenever the parents or the teacher asked her to do something like an assignment or to finish a task or a chore at home, then their daughter would say, I can't do that. You know, because of my ADHD, I can't do that. So you want to make certain that they understand ADHD. They understand that it's a learning difference. However, ADHD isn't who they are. It's simply a label of a learning difference and they can still achieve great things. They might have to go about it a different way, but they can definitely reach their full potential and remind them uh, the fact that many Uh, people that they know in their lives, successful people that they know also have ADHD. So you might tie in yourself or another adult, maybe their teacher has ADHD, maybe their grandparents have ADHD, some friend of yours may have ADHD, and you can pinpoint those individuals and say, you know, all of these people, very successful, have ADHD. And that does not define them. That does not tell them what they can and cannot do. Of course, you can also bring in a variety of famous people who have ADHD. We know plenty of athletes um, from Michael Phelps to Simone Biles and many artists like Justin Timberlake and even entrepreneurs like Richard Branson all have ADHD and yet they are incredibly successful in their fields. So again, if you have not yet had that conversation, think about broaching the subject and having that conversation with your child. Try not to make any assumptions because again, your perception of what they understand may be very different than what they actually understand. So make certain you have that conversation. Also, you want to make certain you highlight your child's natural talents and everyone has a talent. Sometimes those talents come through naturally, right? You may have a child who's been singing since she was two years old. So obviously that was her talent. It was not hidden. So immediately you enrolled her in music lessons Or maybe you have a dancer and your child just continually danced as a child. And so you enrolled that child into dance lessons. So sometimes those talents come through naturally. Other times, especially as your child gets a little bit older, especially in those teen years, it may be more difficult to see what excites them what their natural talents are. So it's important to expose them to a variety of activities. So it might be a new sport, it might be a musical instrument, it might be bringing them to a a museum in town. It may be going on a hike, exploring nature. Make certain that you explore different opportunities so that you can find their natural talents. And then once you find their talent, that's when you can highlight and celebrate those talents and giving them an opportunity to really shine because sometimes they don't have that opportunity. So you make sure that there are certain opportunities throughout the week where those talents can be really highlighted. And I used to do that as a teacher. I can think of a particular activity that I did years ago when I was in the classroom. And I always tried to pair up children with different abilities when we did group work. And uh, one group I can remember very, uh, very clearly. And that is I had a few students in the group who were really strong academically, right? They were bright and they could follow through. They had strong executive function. So academics came very easy for them. And uh, so I would pair them up 
with my child who also was bright, but maybe had some weak executive function or ADHD. So the academic, the organization, the, the processes may not have been his strong point, but he was incredibly creative. He thought in completely differently from the other children. So I knew he could really bring something to that group. So the goal for the group was for them to write an original play and to write the play. Then they had to create the props. They had to design the stage and then they had to act. So for that group, of course, the students who were strong in academics and they were able to come up with this storyline and then they could talk about the story and of course they could all contribute to how the story would go, they could be in charge of writing the script. But then the child who thought outside the box and was incredibly creative could do all the design and bring so much to that group that the other children really couldn't do, but he could bring that talent, that natural creative spirit to that group and really complete the group. And his talents were highlighted. So think about even if you're not in the classroom, just in your home, what are certain jobs you could give your child that would highlight his or her natural talents and really celebrate those areas? Once you find their talents, of course, it's easy to recognize and reward their effort. Now, when we talk about re recognizing and rewarding, it's important to keep in mind that praise is important. Of course it is. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that, right? Because when we get in the day-to-day, -day, sometimes it's easy to point out what's going wrong, right? And miss the little things that are going really well. But when you do think about praise and rewarding, make certain that you are rewarding the effort. So effective praise really focuses on the effort, okay? That's what you want to start focusing on. So no matter what the end result, because the end result may not be what your child really envisioned or may not be what the child wanted. So perhaps they didn't win the game or perhaps they didn't get an A on the project they just completed, but that's okay. What was the effort that was put forth? That's what we wanna focus on. And that's what we want to reward and praise the effort that was in that process. Now, if they were successful, if they did get that end result they wanted, of course you want to rec recognize the success, right? Recognize the fact that they won the game or that he or she got an A on their paper. But not only recognizing the end, but also discussing what contributed to their success. What went into that process? What was the effort? What did they do that helped them succeed? because you do want them to reflect on what they learned so that they can apply those skills consistently. And you know that when an individual has weak executive function or ADHD, that consistency in performance can be very difficult. So the more you model this process, reflecting on the effort, reflecting on what contributed to their success, the more likely it is that they will use those skills on a consistent basis. And of course, as always, ask them what they learned from that process, because this is a great motto. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. Really making certain that your child understands that putting in the effort is incredibly important. And sometimes you'll win in the end but sometimes you simply learn from that process and we can then move on. And this really helps with the motivation to try different things. It also helps with emotion regulation because so many of our individuals, of course, 
part of executive function is emotion regulation. So it's important they understand that it's okay if things don't go their way, that we tried and now we learn and now we're going to move on. So a great motto for you to use on the day-to-day. -day. Also motivate. So once you find their talents, you're rewarding and praising the effort. When you praise the effort, you're contributing to motivation, right? When they know it's okay if I don't make the A or if we don't win the game, if uh, you know I don't achieve specifically the goal I was searching for, or maybe I wasn't perfect, that's okay. You can be more motivated because there are small goals in place, right? It's the effort that's important. So motivation will really start to improve. And of course, self-esteem influences motivation. So as your child's self-esteem is improving, you'll also see that they're more motivated because people with a healthy, positive view of themselves, they understand their potential and will feel inspired and will be more likely to try new things, to take on new challenges. So all of these areas go hand in hand. When we talk about motivation, just like we talked about their specific ways to provide praise, there's really specific process in developing motivation. One is to set those mini goals, right? Because it is important that you're very clear in the goal. Sometimes your child may seem unmotivated to do a certain project, and it may be just because the project is way too big, right? There's way too much information there for them. So again, they feel defeated before they even started. Or if they have uh, difficulty with organization or difficulty with processing speed, when you give them a large goal that has lots of steps, they may start, again, avoiding that situation where they appear to be unmotivated, but actually it's that fear of failure, right? That avoidance that's kicking in. So we want to set clear mini goals. So instead of saying, let's uh, read more, you might say, let's read at least 20 minutes every day. That's our goal. Or maybe instead of looking at a math paper and saying, let's do all 20 of these problems within 15 minutes, break it down. Let's just start with five of these mathematical problems, and then we'll take a break. When you set mini goals, some small achievable goal, then they're going to be able to get to task and really it will motivate them to put in the effort because it seems like a small achievable goal. And we do this within play attention as well. Uh, when you are working in different cognitive areas, whether it's uh, task completion or auditory processing or visual tracking or maybe social skills, sheer genius, our artificial intelligence will set mini goals to provide motivation. So before they even start a certain activity, it will say yesterday you completed time on task with 70% attention. Today, let's try 72% attention. And if you do that, you'll earn a point and the point will go into your reward system. And we're going to talk about rewards here too. But all of that type of clear steps towards motivating your child is actually written within play attention. You also want to get your child involved in the decision making, because if you are constantly looking at your child and telling your child what to do or what the assignment is, and you never ask them for their opinion, then that can negatively affect their self-esteem. So even if you're going to give them options and you're kind of guiding them to the decision you want them to make, it's important that you do get them involved in the decision-making, that you do listen to what they have to say. The more you get them involved and making them feel like they have some control over that task at hand, the more motivated they will be in order to achieve that task. 
or end the, do the task at hand. Um, so it's really important to get their feedback. And when they know that you listen to them and that you really uh, do appreciate their feedback, that's going to help with self-esteem as well and provide time to reflect. All of these areas, we always provide them time to reflect on the process and what they've learned. Now, I mentioned rewards earlier because I mentioned within Play Attention, we set those mini goals and then we allow them to uh, receive a reward. And rewards can be very motivational for many people, but there are different types of rewards and different types of motivation. Now, when you're setting up a reward system, there should be small short-term goals and there should be larger goals that are going to take longer to reach. And if you have small mini goals, then you can have a little reward that goes along with that, okay? And a lot of times, especially early on in this process, they need that external motivation, right? They need to be... Uh, given something, some kind of token, and that can often motivate them to try again um, because they are externally motivated. Eventually, as I said in my last line there, from to move from the extrinsic to the intrinsic, we want them to become internally motivated. And this is quite a process, but as you actually improve their self-esteem, improve motivation, you're going to see that, wow, they're seeing that they are doing better in school. They are getting along with their peers. They're getting a lot of positive feedback and you'll see them move from having to be externally motivated to really being internally motivated. But that does take time. It is a process for many children. And when you set up your reward system, like I was saying earlier, you want small mini goals with small rewards and then larger rewards. So a lot of times in play attention, when we're sitting, setting up the reward system, you might have a small reward. Like when you earn uh, 10 play attention points, you can select the, the family game on family game night or a long-term reward because that one you might be able to purchase at the end of a week, but a long-term reward might be trip to amusement park is a hundred points. And then they have to store their points in order to purchase that at a later time. This is known as delayed gratification. And delayed gratification is so important in the learning process and for success later in life. If you are able to delay gratification, it has been shown that you will have better life outcomes. And if you haven't looked at the marshmallow study, uh, that might be something you want to look at. Uh, it's really interesting. And if you look at the original videos from back, I think it was in the 60s, you can find it on YouTube. The videos are hysterical of the children who could wait for the bigger reward, which was two marshmallows rather than just eating that one marshmallow right away. So important when you're setting up rewards to do small, immediate rewards, but then also long-term rewards in order to teach delayed gratification. This might be one of the most important things we talk about, and that's to develop emotional connections. There have been, uh, interesting studies and, you know, emotional connections. When we talk about that, we're not just talking about family relationships. And of course, we know that it's important that you have loving, caring, close family connections, but it's also important that they have close connections with their peers and their community. There was a landmark study done by Harvard, which found that social connections or I should say the lack of social connections was more detrimental to overall health than obesity, high blood pressure, and a lack of exercise. So lifestyle choices sometimes when uh, you may be, uh, you might not have a great lifestyle um, and maybe you need more exercise or a healthy diet, 
the thing that really was more detrimental to people's health was a lack of social connections. So that's really important to keep in mind that it is so critical that we help our children develop the social skills they need in order to develop those long-term relationships. People who feel more connected to others have lower levels of anxiety and depression. Studies have shown that they also have higher self-esteem, greater empathy for others, and are more trusting and cooperative. So this is really important. And we know that many children and adults with ADHD have a hard time with social interactions sometimes. Sometimes there's no problem at all. You know, I talk to a lot of parents who will say, my child has a million friends. That is not one of our issues. And that's great. But for those of you who know that your child is having a hard time with peer relationships, it may be because they miss social cues. It may be because they have a lack of inhibitory control. So they're very impulsive. They might miss the fact that they continually get into someone's space. They don't know how to give someone else space and pick up on those social cues and respond appropriately. So there are some steps that you may need to take in order to help develop those strong relationships. Now within Play Attention, if you're looking at your program, we do have a social skills uh, module available. And that module actually teaches you how to pay attention to the social cue, process that information, and then respond appropriately. And it may seem like a very simple process, but for many people with ADHD, that is just something they've missed. It's not something that they've developed, but we can teach it directly. Also, you may want to take into account how you can set up play dates. Instead of having a play date at a park where there are lots of other children, that might not be an ideal situation. Um, so you might want to organize smaller play dates where it's more one-on-one. -on -one. Usually they'll do pretty well in those situations and then gradually introduce more and more children. But you want, might want to organize those play dates in a different way. Because remember, part of ADHD is also not so much a deficit of attention. It's not that they have a lack of attention. It's usually that they have great attention. It's just diffused over a variety of things, right? They're paying attention to absolutely everything. So when they get into a social situation, if they are paying attention to absolutely everything, they're on sensory overload. And if there are a lot of children around them, a lot of people talking or shouting or playing, can be very overwhelming and difficult for them to focus and to control their impulsive nature. So think about the groups and how you're setting up those play dates. Also, not only did we say that it's important to develop those peer relationships, but they should also have an opportunity to connect to their community as well. So you might want to look into certain volunteer opportunities that will really spark their interest and maybe uh, highlight some of their natural talents. So if you have a child, let's say, who loves animals, maybe you could volunteer at an animal shelter and uh, allow your child to walk the dogs. I know a lot of shelters have those programs. And uh, so that might be something to connect them to community. Or you may uh, volunteer at a food bank, or perhaps your child has a lot of energy. So you sign your child up to help clean one of the hiking trails locally. That way, way they can be on the go, but they're also contributing to their community. So think about how you can develop that connectiveness to individuals around you and your community. That social connected, connectedness generates a positive feedback loop, which of course leads to improved self-esteem. 
Now, finally, let's talk about how we can improve executive function, because just as we started this, um, this webinar, we started the webinar by talking about how weak executive function really negatively affects self-esteem. So weak executive function includes poor impulse control, weak emotional control, diffused attention, decreased ability to reason, poor organizational skills. So of course, that weak executive function undermines one's self-esteem by weakening the very foundation of our ability to learn and maintain positive relationships. So what can we do? Well, the good news is we can develop stronger executive function. And that's exactly what Play Attention does. Play Attention integrates feedback technology with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping to provide you with the most comprehensive approach to developing uh, developing strong executive function. You've noticed here that this student has our body wave technology on. This is our body wave technology. It is an a advanced armband. It's NASA inspired technology. There are three sensors on the back. And you notice that our student here has that armband on his arm. And that is monitoring his brain activity that tells us how attentive he is. And then that information is given over to the computer where he's allowed to control all of these cognitive exercises just with his mind or more specifically, his attention alone. And he receives constant and immediate feedback as to whether or not he truly is focused and paying attention. So it's important to look at all of these cognitive areas, attention, stamina, task completion, auditory processing, working memory. We have all of these different cognitive exercises that we address because we know that these areas lay the foundation for strong executive function. If you want your child to be more organized or to have strong uh, emotion regulation, then they have to be able to pay attention to the situation, process the information, control their impulsive nature. And all of those skills are what you're working on in every single play attention activity. And remember, all of these activities are brain enabled, meaning if you're not paying attention, then the activity is going to stop. The character will go in the right, wrong direction and you have to focus back in in order to continue. And we do this because we know the very first catalyst necessary for brain change is attention. In order to improve any cognitive skill, in order to strengthen executive function, you have to be paying attention to the process. So when you look at all of these cognitive areas, you might think, well, when or how do I know which areas I need to work on specifically or my child needs to work on specifically? We do have an assessment package available for you. Now, I know some of you here today are current clients and you have Play Attention. Some of you have not yet started your Play Attention program. So this is available to everyone. Um, if you would like to do an assessment to really assess your child's needs or even your own needs, because as we talked about earlier, we work with many families where we work with the parents and the children uh, simultaneously. So we have a couple of assessments available. One is called FOCUS, which is a norm reference test of attentional control. Uh, and that is computer-based. It takes 20 minutes. And at the end, we receive a full report that tells us how you perform to the uh, performance of your peers. And uh, we also have the brief available. And the brief is a behavior rating of executive function. So that gives us a really good overview of executive function. And if you're looking at assessing your child, you can do this for your child or the teacher can fill it out on your child. Or if your child is 13 or older, your child can do a self-assessment, which is really sometimes very interesting to see as well, to see them reflect on their own executive function. Once we do the assessments, then we can have about 30 to 40 minute consultation 
where we review the results, and then we can pinpoint all of these cognitive areas. We can actually pinpoint and customize the plan. Which areas do we need to set up in that individual's profile in order to strengthen executive function? Typically, the assessments um, are and I see a few of you, Lakeisha says you'd love to participate. So if you are interested in the assessment process, um, usually each assess assessment is $50, but part of our webinar special is a half price. So if you would like to have more information on the assessments, you can do the focus or the brief, or you could do both, but you will receive those at half price. But then remember, once you complete them, we will need about a 30 to 40 minute block of time to review the results with you and have that consultation. Um, so we can not only pinpoint the areas of difficulty, but then we can look at a plan of action. And uh, so if you want more information on the assessment, just type in assessment and we will reach out to you in order to provide you with more information on that. Uh, so just type in assessment and we'll reach out to you following the webinar to help you with that process and give you a little bit more information, okay? So now we've talked about several different ways that you can uh, boost your child's self-esteem. First of all, remember to talk to your child about ADHD because what your child believes to be true and what you want your child to understand about ADHD may be two different things. Also, make certain you take the time to highlight your child's natural talents. Remember to recognize and reward effort. So we're not talking about participation awards, not just you are rewarded for showing up, but you're rewarded for the effort you put into the task at hand. Also, remember those steps we talked about on how to motivate develop emotional connections. I want you to really think about that. How can you start developing those emotional connections, whether it's through play attention, whether it's smaller play dates, or it may be a volunteer organization to help them connect to the community. And then finally, remember the root of everything to help them develop that strong self-esteem. We need to make certain that they have the skills they need in order to be successful, in order to truly reach their potential. So we want to focus on a plan to help them improve executive function. I hope you found this video insightful. Leave us a like and consider subscribing for more mind-empowering content.